Hey everyone, I'm Claudia and I just finished my bachelor's degree at the University of Toronto and I'm super excited to be talking to you guys about turtle sociality um, and how snapping turtle vocalizations are associated with energetic benefits. And so in the animal kingdom, acoustic communication is widespread. It's seen in birds, mammals, amphibians, insects, and even fish. And these acoustic signal signals are very often linked to elaborate social behaviors that can increase fitness fitness in many contexts, including so sexual selection, predator avoidance, and cooperative behavior that increases energetic gains. And so when it comes to not avian reptiles, the study of social behavior is often neglected, especially in comparison to mammals and birds. They aren't traditionally seen as charismatic and are often recognized as these cold-blooded or cold-hearted uh, organisms. And so the notion of parental care, or social groups, or even courtship are less recognized, which is why the diversity and complexity of social behavior in reptiles has been largely underestimated. Despite this, reptile social systems and acoustic signals can be quite elaborate, where acoustic signals are used in social interactions, such as courtship, aggression, parental care, um, and group mi migrations. And so acoustic signals is relatively new in reptiles, where turtles, for example, were historically believed to be voiceless. But today we know that more than 45 species are known to vocalize with 29 of them being terrestrial or tortoises. But why do they vocalize in the first place? Aside from one species, we don't really know why. Um, there has been some evidence. Um, we know that tortoises vocalize in courtship, but in terms of aquatic turtles, there's not really a good understanding why. And so the leading hypotheses suggest that hatchling turtles vocalize to elicit parental care, synchronize hatching where they can modify development and hatch at the same time um, as their siblings um, or coordinate emergence from the nest. Parental care is completely possible, but it's only seen in the South American river turtle, Podocnemus expansa, which is a turtle that has elaborate social systems. And so in my um, project specifically, I focused on the latter two hypotheses where I investigated whether vocalizations are a feasible mechanisms for synchronous hatching and or emergence because these are behaviors that are observed across numerous turtle species. And so I used the widely distributed snapping turtle, Chelydra serpentina, and I performed three separate experiments, which I will talk about today. First, we wanted to see whether snapping turtle hatchlings vocalize in the nest because we didn't know at the time. And second, if they did, we wanted to know what hatching period this was occurring. Uh, to do this, we collected eggs from the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station and set up a simulated nest in a glass aquarium. So shown in the picture, we buried eggs in sand with a microphone and left a viewing panel um, on the side of the aquarium. I then set up a red light and placed a camera in front of the aquarium uh, to omit natural light. And I then connected a recorder to the microphone to record audio continuously until hatchlings emerged. So using the pictures from the camera, we were able to define three distinct hatching periods. The first panel shows the pre-pipping stage where all eggs have not hatched yet. The second panel shows the pipping stage where hatchlings have broken the eggshell but have not started to climb up. And the third panel shows the emerging stage where at least one hatchling has started to ascend towards the surface. Overall, we found that after sampling nine hours of recordings, we detected 261 vocalizations and characterized them into at least five distinct types. To analyze the vocalizations, we used Raven Pro, uh, which is a sound al analysis software. And in the figure, we can see that uh, um, there is an oscillogram at the top, which shows the sound's amplitude. And at the bottom, there is the spectrogram, which shows the frequency of each sound. So type one sounds are relatively short with about one to three pulses um, at a, a higher frequency compared to the other types. Type two sounds are these short harmonic or not non-harmonic sounds that have four to seven pulses with a lower frequency. Then type three sounds are longer with about 10 or more pulses and relatively higher frequency. Then type four sounds are these short sounds with high frequencies and a clearly defined harmonic band. They have the clearly defined harmonic bands, which is shown in the spectrograms. Um, 
And then similar to type four, we have type fives, which are personally my favorite. Uh, they're these, they have these really nice, well-defined harmonic bands, um, which you can tell in the spectrogram. And they have a significant, they have a very much lower um, frequency range than the other sound types. And so by comparing vocalization count over each behavioral period, we observed that vocalizations were more frequent uh, and more complex after hatching from the eggs. So before pipping, we only see these type one vocalizations, which are relatively simple. And then in the latter half, we see these more complex type, types two to five uh, being produced, which is consistent with um, other studies with sea turtles uh, that found a similar result. So this tells us that more complex information may be exchanged among siblings during pipping and emergence. However, there's not enough information to attribute a communicative function. And so why are snapping turtles vocalizing in the first place? Well, it's very likely that the vocalizations function in synchronized emergence or hatching. And if this is true, then we may expect there to be an overall energetic or some sort of evolutionary benefit to nest sociality uh, that would increase uh, hatchlings fitness. And for the, re the reason for this is that less energy that is expended during emergence provides more energy for post-emergence activities, such as escaping predation and finding a suitable site to overwinter. The goal, so the goal of our second experiment was to see whether nest sociality is energetically beneficial to hatchlings. To do this, we use a similar setup as the aquarium, except this time we buried eggs in jars and covered the viewing windows with Bristol board. More specifically, we set up a two by two factorial design where we manipulated depth and sociality. The deep treatments were buried, um, we buried eggs at a five or 15 centimeter depth. And the sociality treatment, we either placed 10 eggs with their siblings or one egg and nine plastic balls in the nest. And the plastic balls were used to keep the nest cavity intact. We then recorded the day of first pipping and the amount of weight loss after emerging from the nest. Uh, and so in this talk specifically, I'm going to be talking about the results that pertain to sociality. So overall, we found that sociality or the presence of siblings significantly advanced PIP date by 1.6 days. And we see that in the figure, the social treatments were often the first to PIP or hatch with respect to each clutch. And the hatchlings that hatched, um, that hatched alone hatched significantly later. This is especially cool because it indicates that siblings uh, have a cue, they, they, all, they have some sort of cue that would modify the hatching behavior that you may expect um, if development were to proceed as normal. And by subtracting the median egg mass, uh, which was measured before the eggs uh, were put in their treatment and the median hatchling mass after they emerge, we see that hatchlings that emerged as a group lost 0 0.5 grams less weight than hatchlings emerging alone. This may not seem like a lot, but it's approximately 5% of a hatchling's body mass. So it's, it's quite a bit for a small hatchling. Um, and so this shows that not only do siblings modify hatching behavior, but hatchlings in a group lose less weight and gain more energy as they um, emerge in, in a group. And so clearly there's a cooperative behavior that benefits hatchling fitness, and that means that the leading two hypotheses that vocalizations, cue hatching, or synchronized emergence is entirely possible. But this doesn't necessarily mean that vocalizations are a mechanism for this cooperative behavior. But I couldn't help but wonder whether vocalizations played a role in it. And so I decided to take the experiment uh, one step further. And so using our results from the first two experiments, I decided to directly test the synchronous hatch hatching hypothesis and see whether hatchlings behaviorally respond to vocalizations. To test this, I set up a playback experiment to see if vocalizations would affect hatch timing. Um, I placed eggs in individual plastic containers to isolate sibling interactions, and I placed an ear phone next to each hatchling to play sound clips on a continuous loop. Now these sound clips were separated into three treatments. The first treatment was a vocal treatment where we continuously played one hour of vocalizations, uh, which was obtained from previously recorded re pipping sequences where we knew vocalizations would be played. The second treatment was a noise treatment where we continuously played uh, white noise, which ranged from 500 hertz to 15 kilohertz, uh, which is the range of the sounds that we detected. And the third treatment was a no noise or a silent treatment where we did not play any sound uh, to the eggs. And so each MP3 player was 
con then connected to about 10 eggs for a total of 60 eggs. And so do vocalizations cue hatching? After controlling for clutch effects and the egg's relative position in the nest, our results indicate that vocalizations do not affect hatch timing. So relative pip date is quite spread out over a period of 15 days, and the average pip date is quite similar among vocal white noise and no noise treatments. This result is quite shocking because many researchers thought that there would be an effect. That was the leading hypothesis. Um, hypothesis. And so even though sociality affects hatching and has this energetic benefit, it's unlikely that this behavior occurs through vocalizations. Other mechanisms for synchronous hatching could be a circadian rhythm, such as oxygen consumption or metabolic rate, or even vibrations or mechanical um, set, me mechanical stimulation from hatching siblings. And so this leaves us with the synchronous emergence hypothesis that has yet to be tested in turtles at large. Since more complex vocalizations occur after hatching, it's possible that they facilitate nest emergence. The complex vocalizations that occur after ha hatching may indicate more complex information is being exchanged and these short high frequency sounds are often optimal for communication at short distances. So in summary, our study shows that snapping turtles vocalize before uh, and after hatching. We also add to our knowledge of ha turtle hatching behavior where snapping turtles modify their development timing, timing and reduce the amount of time it takes to hatch. We also find that group emergent provide Emergence provides an energetic benefit by increasing the amount of energy for post nest emergence behaviors. And then, contrary to a leading hypothesis, we also found that hatchlings vocalize to that vocalizations don't affect hatch timing. And so, to date, voc hatchling vocalization studies have been largely observational. So, it's pretty cool that we use playback experiments to test the function of acoustic signals. And I think that this approach will be essential for furthering our understanding of their behaviors. Uh, this also leads us to wonder. Uh, what other mechanisms are facilitating synchronous in hatching. And so that's why I'm super excited to continue this project through a master's this fall, where I plan to try to disentangle the function of these acoustic signaling systems by comparing vocalizations and species life history traits across a broader range of species. I also plan to investigate other aspects of their behaviors, including hatchling emergence, or even the cost of vocalizing, um, which would include the risk of vocalizing vocalizing in the presence of predators. And so thank you all for listening. And I'd like to acknowledge that this work wouldn't be possible without the ongoing supervision and collaboration with doctors, Christina Davey and Niall Rawlinson. They've been really great during this whole process. Um, and thanks so much for watching and I look forward to your questions. <laughs>